Let's now apply some of the concepts that have come up because of energy and mot momentum in the relativistic context. Now, one of the interesting things that we know from particle physics is that the neutron, the uncharged particle that's in the nucleus of atoms, if it's just sitting on its own, it is not a stable particle. If you take a neutron, you just sit on your table, on average, it'll have a lifespan of 10 minutes. Some will decay probably before that, some after, but on average, that's what you're going to expect. 10 minutes later, it's gone. But it doesn't just disappear, it's going to actually decay into other particles. So after it goes off, it's going to basically become a proton, positively charged, and an electron, negatively charged. There's also going to be this little neutrino guy, but we're going to ignore that in part because the neutrino is such a tiny, 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 tiny particle. It's almost massless. It took a long time to figure out it had a mass. So the effect is small. So just for simplicity, we're going to imagine the neutron is going to decay and it's going to be become a proton and an electron. Now, here's the interesting thing. The neutron has a certain amount of mass. The proton and electron have masses as well. But we have an interesting problem. The mass of the neutron is greater than the mass of the proton, the mass of the electron. It's even greater than the mass of both of them put together. So this actually means that when the decay happens, there is some amount of mass that apparently has disappeared. This seems normally impossible, but because of E equals mc squared, we realize, oh, well, that amount of mass has now become energy. What kind of energy? Specifically, it's going to become the kinetic energy of our decay products. So not only will the neutron fall apart and become two particles, and the neutrino, which we'll ignore, but the proton and electron are both going to have some amount of kinetic energy. How much, though, requires some work. So for simplicity, let's assume the, neutri the neutron is just sitting there. It has no kinetic energy. It has no momentum. And then after the decay, we have the two particles shooting off. So if we were to do momentum conservation, how much does the momentum of the system change? That should be zero. Initially, the momentum of the system is zero, which has to equal the final momentum. So we actually then have the momentum of the proton plus the momentum of the electron. Now, of course, momentum is a vector. So this basically is going to be telling us then that the proton and electron will have the same quantity of momentum, but in opposite directions. So basically, we could rewrite this as the momentum of the proton equal the momentum of the electron. So simple, straightforward conservation of momentum. Now to figure out how much momentum each particle will have and what sort of speeds we could possibly have, how much energy are either of these particles going to have? Well, we can work that out because we have another equation that we can play with. We know from relativity that energy squared is going to be momentum squared c squared plus mass squared times speed of light to the fourth power. So the energy of any given particle is going to be an addition of something with its uh, mass and something with its actual momentum. So we could actually rewrite this, and this actually will make it so we don't have to worry about um, our absolute value symbols here. We can now just rewrite this expression as momentum of the proton squared equals the momentum of the electron squared. And so we can start substituting things in. The energy of the electron squared divided by the speed of light squared 
minus the mass electron squared, speed of light squared, will equal then the similar thing when we're dealing with momentum of protons, energy of the proton squared divided by C speed of light squared minus mass of the proton squared times speed of light squared. So simply taking our momentum conservation equation, squaring both sides, and then substituting this expression in when we had solved for momentum and plugging in here for each respective particle. Now it seems like I have two unknowns in this expression, the energy of the electron, energy of the proton, but we do have one other thing. The amount of energy we have, the amount of kinetic energy we have, is going to be that amount of energy we had when it came to the difference in first the mass of the neutron, how much energy it had, mass of the proton, mass of the electron, so that's how much energy is supposed to be released in there. Now how much energy goes into each particle, well we don't know, but we could simply set up and realize, oh well, that amount of energy is going to be equal to the amount of energy that goes in the electron, amount of energy that goes into the proton, and we could solve this expression, just do the algebra and say, all right, energy of the proton is equal to the total energy we have minus the energy going into the electron. So, again, what we've done, this expression ultimately comes from conservation of momentum and substituting in this expression from special relativity. The amount of energy we have is going to be how much mass is missing from our setup. And that amount of energy goes into the kinetic energy of the electron, the kinetic energy of the proton. So we can set up this relationship. So we actually have two equations with two unknowns. We actually have sufficient room to solve. So I'm going to start substituting in what I had in for the energy of the proton. And we have to do a little bit of expansion. So what we find is this large expression. So we see something kind of nice that uh, this and this are going to cancel out. So actually, it's not going to be a quadratic we have to solve. Thank goodness. Makes things a little bit easier. But we have a little bit of algebraic manipulation if we want to solve for how much energy is going to the electron. And if we do that, we get the following form. Here. If you want, you can go through and do the algebra yourself and see that I have something right. Uh, one of the ways I can check to see that this is reasonable is if the two particles popping off from the decay were the same mass, if these two masses were the same, well, this term would just completely cancel out, and so the amount of energy going to one of those particles is equal to exactly half the amount of total energy. So each particle gets the same amount of energy, the same amount of momentum in the end, as it would be, you know, what you would ultimately expect. So, looks like a somewhat ugly expression, but all these things are at either be known or measurable with the setup. In fact, we do know everything. If we know the mass of the proton, the electron, and if we know the mass of the neutron, we can know the energy here, the amount of energy left over, and plug all that in and we can find how much energy is left then for the electron to find. And of course we can always then extend this back to and equal to how fast ultimately the electron is going. This is again the kinetic energy, so this will be the expression of gamma minus 1 mass of the electron squared, speed of light squared, oops, not that there, but the speed of light squared, not the mass squared. Okay, so in this setup, the only thing that actually depends on the velocity is here in the gamma function. So obviously there's a lot of algebra we'd have to do to ultimately find this, but then we can find out, all right, how quickly should the electron be moving? That's if we wanted to find its ultimate velocity, but more often the way particle physicists will deal with this is just say, well, how much energy does the electron actually have? And they'll leave it usually in units of things like electron volts just for convenience. So for comparison's sake, the energy in the, just the mass energy of the electron 
is about 511 kilo electron volts. The proton has a mass energy of around 500, or sorry, 938 mega electron volts, and the proton, or sorry, the neutron has a little bit more than 939 mega electron volts, or a million electron volts of mass energy to play with. So we can work that out, find all the numbers if you so prefer, but I should leave at least some work to the reader, and so you can figure out, okay, according to this, what should be the energy of the electron in electron volts, just as an energy type, and we can, of course, go back and find, all right, how much energy then does the proton have, and you can always go back, triple check, and make sure that there aren't any mistakes that both have their energies adding up to the amount of energy missing, and we'll also make sure that momentum is conserved overall, and you can find how fast either of these particles are going. And, of course, you should discover the electron is shooting off with a lot of velocity, even though both the proton and electron have the same momentum.